Good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning. Good morning. Oh. As you can see from the overlay, it's Tuesday the 28th of March. And it's Derek Watson, the angry dentist here, on his way to work, as he is every single day of his effing life. I'm working class, that's the trouble. People think dentists are middle class or upper middle class. We are not. We are working class. We work bloody hard. It's a foggy day, and which makes it feel a bit colder. But it's the time of year, at least, I mean, if you're watching this in the north, then get prepared to be upset because we've had the daffodils, they've been and gone. Everybody's cutting their grass now. Considering it's the end of March, right? We're now like, we're doing stuff in the end of March now. We used to do it at the beginning of May. So, the climate change is going down quite well in the south and uh, probably in the north as well. And now we've got a president of the United States who says he doesn't believe in it. In charge of the sort of the, the country that's the biggest polluter. Well, not the biggest polluter, but I mean, probably the biggest first world country that could do anything about it There's, which is now going to do nothing what we've got we've got a problem with governance people you know all the people say oh there's a problem with the NHS there's a problem with this or that or defense or whatever whatever you like there's no there's no problem with anything other than the way we govern and it's not because I'm anti-democratic or anything. I mean, I do, obviously, I believe in democracy. But I just, what what we've got, you know when Trump talks about draining the swamp in Washington? We've got our own swamp <laughs> over here. We've got a, in the same way as uh, paedophiles tend to seek out jobs where they can abuse children, people who are you know, like to abuse power tend to seek out positions of power. And I'm not just talking about politicians. I mean, you know, there are the people like this in the police force and who like cracking heads. And uh, they, they naturally gravitate, don't they, to the sort of job that gives them what they want in life. And this, speaking as someone who's given evidence to two House of Commons select committees, right? So it's not like I'm not familiar with the way that Parliament works. One of my last uh, questions... Uh, to the chairman of the uh, Health Select Committee, when he asked for questions, was that uh, you know when they when they did the sort of the report of the last investigation into dentistry, was that what's going to happen if you you know you make all these recommendations to the Department of Health? What happens if they don't? If they just completely ignore them? And I knew they would because they'd had a previous uh, parliamentary select committee inquiry into NHS dentistry and come up with a bunch of recommendations and they'd ignored those. So. Uh, he said, oh, uh, well, you know, we, uh, we'll have the Secretary of State back, back, we'll call her back, we'll call him back and hold him to account. Uh, what are you going to do? Poke him in the eye? You know, Department of Health treats the uh, House of Commons with complete disrespect. They, they pay lip service to their authority, you know. So, what happens is, there's a few MPs, well, probably one or two, who know something about what they're talking about. Let's just run through our MPs. Right? We've got Sir Paul Beresford, MP for Mole Valley, wherever that is, probably full of moles. And, uh, I'm probably sorry, I mean, it's some sort of blue chip. The thing that's been conservative since Julius Caesar type constituency and uh, you know part-time practicing dentist lovely guy nice guy I mean I mean as a politician you can't be an offensive politician so I mean you know you've got to subtract a few points for having to be nice anyway but I think genuinely a nice guy but probably you know did his best work a few years ago like everyone else, you know, I mean, he's older than me and I'm looking to retire, so I'm sure he's looking to have retired by now, if he hasn't already done it. And then, uh, 
old Lord Lucan, Lord Lord Howe. Oh dear, not Howe. Tony, what's his second name? It's going to sound really bad. Sorry if you're watching this, Tony. <laughs> Let's do Earl Howe. Let's do Earl Howe. Not Lord Howe, who's the Geoffrey Howe, was the Foreign Secretary. Lord Howe, who was given the job of running dentistry when, at the last uh, reshuffle, when they decided that they were going to get it to everybody who was, who was democratically unelected. And that's another one of the problems. Dentistry is in the hands of people who are unelected. If the people who are running dentistry were elected, we would be able to put some pressure on them, wouldn't we? We would be able to say, look, you know, if you don't start being a bit sensible about this, then we'll vote you out. But they don't care. The last, you know, the chief dental officer. Who votes the chief dental officer in or out? Who is the effing chief dental officer anyway? I mean, at least with Cockroft, you, you know, you had a villain there, didn't you? you know, at least he used to walk around with a black cape and a top hat. So you knew, you knew what the problem was. This new woman, I mean, apart from releasing a, a selfie with an overly coiffed hair, taking a, a sort of one of those uh, odd angle that was all the fashion about 15 years ago in corporate brochures. Um, you know, what, <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, okay, I know I am from the army, but I am feminine, okay? I am feminine, I have a feminine side. Here's a picture of me being feminine. <laughs> <laughs> so, and what, Sarah, Hurley, Hurley. What's, what's that all about? How long has she been in the post? 10 years, 20 years, I can't remember. That, not, a, not a dicky bird, nothing. Took over Barry Cockroft's legacy, didn't she? Handed a steaming heap of doggy doo-doos on a plate. <laughs> So that was all falling apart based on faulty, idiot, moron thinking with all the really, really difficult problems left unsolved. Here it is, Sarah. Thanks very much. I'm off into the private sector. <laughs> Fuck that up. <laughs> oh, dear. So she sat there. She's probably quivering under her desk. <laughs> she's probably, she's gibbering. She's with gibbering Sarah Hurley. She's done nothing, did nothing, has done nothing. Indetectable. It's probably cost us several hundred thousand pounds to have nothing done for a couple of years. Although I do hear a rumour that there is a new contract coming in. So next year, that's 2018. So the whispers, whispers. But the whispers are not good whispers because the whisper is that the new contract is going to be terrible and worse than the one that you've got. So if you're uh, thinking, you know, Although, as I say, in the early years, you know, you go in early, you do well. It's the it's the de it's the guys who come in at year, you know, the, the pilot the pilots do well. They're under a lot of um, pressure to get the pilots to report back that everything's going really well because they they have this idea, they decide to put it into operation, and the last thing they want is a load of people telling them it's it's a it's a you know it won't work. And that's what, that was the problem with the old GDPA and on the uh, Dental Practitioners Association. They quite frequently went along and, you know, I don't, I hate the Emperor's New Clothes analogy because uh, Kevin Lewis does, relies on the Emperor's New Clothes analogy at least twice a year in his column. So I think it's somewhat overdone, Kevin. But, uh, you know, we, we went along and told them what, straight away, straight away we said that no, no, you're going to have this problem, this is the problem. The guys and girls will not like this because this will be the problem. And nobody likes to be told, do they? Nobody likes to be told, you know, you don't want to do it like that, you want to do it like this. And uh, so you get excluded and your point is, there's no sort of, I want to hear what the objections are so that if they're valid then we can deal with them. There's none of that. It's all like, you know, we'll shut them up, <laughs> shut them up because they think their force of argument is not by, uh, not, it's not a battle of ideas, you know, it's not, a, it's not a battle of policies, it's basically, I'm in government, the law says that I can tell you what to do, and you have to do it, and if I can't use the courts, I'll, I'll use the police, and if I can't use the police, then I'll just crush you with the sort of the weight of 
of the apparatus of government, you know, the civil servants. The, the uh, I'll exclude you from all of our websites so that nobody can find you. I'll, uh, you know, I'll just, uh, I'll just uh, bury you under, because you're, you're, you know, the, the one thing when you're fighting government is you're always less well resourced. You're always short of money. You're always short of time. You know, you've got patience to see. They don't. You know, you can, they've, you, you have to organise as I did, we had organised a national press conference and it really was big, it was front page news at the time and it was the first one we'd done and of course we made mistakes but the Department of Health have, do this every day, you know, every day they know, they know how to rubbish a press conference, they know how to say, you know, if you say well this is going to, you know, put the cost of dentistry up, then they'll, they'll, uh, they've got a whole what they call the comms department, communications department, bringing up the, bringing up the press and saying, um, you know, these guys don't know what they're talking about. They, they don't have access to the figures. They, 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 this is a back of an envelope calculation. Take no notice of it. And then you've got the, uh, the big guys like the BBC and the Times and you know the establishment, multi uh, mainstream media, who, where the government just rings them up and tells them what to print you know just they just ring up the BBC and say look the government's line is this this is what we want to see <laughs> you know so uh, I mean the, the, the BBC arose out of a requirement for the government to have its own news channel and the BBC is, was explicitly in the early days the, the government broadcasting network and there was no uh, question that it took the government line and didn't didn't represent the, any opposition and it was only sort of, uh, sort of in the, you know, the sort of the 50s and 60s, I think, that uh, they even admitted that you know it might might not be a bad idea just to have a little bit of balance, you know, just not to completely quash the, uh, quash the dissenting opinion. But it, but now they won't. Um, and typically, what they do is that they'll have you, you know, you, you'll have a, you'll be rung up and you say, I need you to comment on this story about. Uh, 25% of uh, increase in the number of extractions in under four-year-olds. Uh, you know, 9,000 extractions, 9,000 teeth being taken out of under four-year-olds every year. And uh, what you'll be is you'll be on the phone, <clears throat> and um, then the minister will come on, and the minister will be in a radio car or in the studio. So immediately you you come in like a caller on a phone in, and the minister comes in as being the person that they have. You know they trust enough to invite into the studio to comment on and also they always you know you're always on first they're always on second it's not like if the minister had been on first then whoever's commenting on the minister will say yeah well actually um, the minister is actually not correct on that and they can't have that so so the minister has the final say and they don't let you back on it's not like you're you're allowed to come back on and say actually no the minister said that's not true but in fact this is my proof. You can't say that. So, so obviously, you know, the government. And as I say, and this is not. Uh, this is just a, the format. You know, it's the format. You put up with it. You know, when you've done it a few times, you know it's going to happen. So uh, yeah. So what became of the House of Commons Select Committee? I mean, nothing. You know, really nothing. It's a complete, complete and utter waste of time and space and just a job creation exercise for uh, various MPs. So uh, an Earl Howe, <clears throat> talking about being undemocratically elected, I mean this guy is the is the great, he's, he's a descendant of, if I remember correctly, uh, Henry VIII's nursemaid. Okay, so Henry VIII <laughs> became King of England, did a few things, and one of the things he did was gave a last large amounts of land and therefore wealth to uh, you know the people around him and one of them was his old nurse maid nursey and so she got a ton of uh, land and castles and stuff that have tumbled down through the generations and ended up in the lap of merchant banker Earl Howe who has now you know who decided that uh, he'd like quite like a career in the House of Lords and uh, so Freddie got the uh, the dentistry remit and uh, really uh, hasn't got a clue about it and 
and uh, it, but but he's a he's a he's a charming 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 establishment toff. I have had the I've had the pleasure. I'm going to call it a pleasure. I had the pleasure of uh, talking to him for about 15 minutes, and basically he had been briefed by a civil servant just before he met me, and so he spouted a few government phrases, you know. But but is it not? You know, do you not know that we are doing this and we are doing this? So yes, I do know that you're doing that, and I've been thinking about it, and I think that you shouldn't do that. Oh well, thank you very much for letting me know. You know, that, where are you going to get with that? I think these politicians, they, you know, we are. You know, you know when you're driving along and you see like a, a night train going past about half eleven or something, and it's empty, right? It's empty, and yet it's still going along. And you think, oh, that's nice. They, you know, the, the rail service is putting on a train for anyone who wants to go from nowhere to nowhere else at 11.30 at night, you know, probably because they've got the franchise and it says they have to run trains between certain hours, but they put this train, but some, there's some poor driver in the front of that, isn't there? There's some poor driver who's, you know, missing his family, perhaps he's a bit short of sleep or he's up early in the morning or something and he's driving this train and, and it's, you know, I mean, he's warm enough, but I mean, it's, it's a desolate old day and it's freezing outside and this train's stopping at all these stations that nobody's ever heard of and and we're like that, you know, the dental, pro I think we're a bit like that, the profession, we are, these politicians, they come in, they have a House of Commons, they have a select inquiry, there's a few smart asses who sort of make a few jokes about dentistry, but we're there, we're there, <laughs> you know, if someone's got toothache in the middle of the night, that's us, we are, we do it all day, every day, we do it all the time, we know exactly what needs to be done, you know, there's a vast amount of experience and a wealth of, uh, a reservoir of uh, ideas and that within the profession that goes completely untapped because the the people who are sort of in charge of us think well you know where we are the government and I, I disagree really really passionately with the British Dental Association about this because their attitude is yeah you're elected and uh, you know it's not our job to tell you how to run dentistry dentistry is part of the Department of Health the Department of Health runs dentistry we don't run dentistry and I think that is completely wrong you know, that, that is completely bass backwards. The dentist should run dentistry, they, you know, and the Department of Health should maintain a light touch, hands-off approach, and just watch us do it properly. You know, they should, they, they can say, well, look, this is your budget for the year. You decide how it's spent. You know, you trained, you've all taken an oath to improve dental health. You, presumably, as dentists, want to do, you know, good dentistry. So, um, you know, we'll uh, you tell us how you want to get it organised, and you know, and only in extremists will we step in and say no. Actually, we've had to think about that, and it's a bad idea. But so, what you've got is you've got this sort of vacuum, policy vacuum, in between the British Dental Association and the Department of Health, where nobody's running dentistry. Okay, the people who know how to run dentistry and could run dentistry, which is the dentists, have had the power taken away from them. And the people who don't know how to run dentistry and who haven't, you know, and 99.9% .9 of the time are not even thinking about dentistry. And when they do, they, uh, you know, they have a couple of, uh, uh, they have a synapse and think it's, it's just, you know, that they're Einstein when they're not. Um, they're, these are the people that have set the rules and, uh, you know, then complain when it all falls apart and say that, oh, dentists are game in the system. Oh dear. Sorry Tony, I can't remember your name. I've been trying to, but I can't. That, oh, and the other one, Baroness Gardener of Parks. Trixie. Call me Trixie. Call me Batty. I don't know how old she is now. She must be 130. Anyway, that's who we've got representing us. A load of bloody unelected I can't think of a word for them. There must be a noun. There must be a noun for a collection of idiots. <laughs> okay, all right, I'm at work. Nice to talk to you. See you tomorrow. Bye.